money will play an essential role in all of the events of the future, including the end times. There's a couple of chapters in the book of Revelation where the economic center of the world at that time, Babylon, is destroyed, and it occupies dozens of verses talking about the destruction of Babylon, the center of the monetary world. So, money's always been important in the past. Everything connected with economics is increasingly important today, but it's driving our world. I think we can assume money will remain important in the future and that it will dominate our world even more in days to come. Get ready. So glad you can join me for today's programming on Understanding the Times Radio. And with all the changes taking place in our world, many are wondering what will become of our financial system, the banking system, our money, investments, and more. I get a lot of emails about this. I'm not an expert. Inflation is affecting every one of my listeners. And we even read about end-time inflation in the Bible, Revelation 6, which is a passage on the seal judgment. That is an ordeal in the seven-year tribulation, but the tribulation is casting a shadow now on this church age. Well, then we have the World Economic Forum saying that someday soon we're going to own nothing and be happy. Frankly, that sounds like global Marxism. And when I say the World Economic Forum's Great Reset is the Tribulation, and you've heard me say that on this program many, many times, I'm just further convinced that the reset is the Tribulation. By the way, as I speak, I believe the meetings in Davos are just ending, and the World Economic Forum met to, well, scheme and plan for a one-world government here just in the last couple of weeks. So cash is going to go away eventually. The Bible even seems to reference that. There is that classic verse in 2 Timothy 3, in the last days men will be lovers of self and money. And the biblical reminder that the love of money is the root of all evil. So we'll also talk about the new COVID economy. Whoever thought there would be lockdowns, government payments to people so generous that half of them have quit working. So all of that is new to the global economy. I'm going to play several sound bites this hour to complement the discussion of financial issues. Joining me this week on Understanding the Times Radio is Dan Celia, founder of Financial Issues Stewardship Ministries. How do we navigate our finances in these unstable times? We'll talk about that this hour. And what about the new COVID economy and some of the strange things that have come along in just the last two years? Dan Celia, welcome for the first time to Understanding the Times Radio. Jed, I appreciate your work. I know it and very thankful that you reached out to me. I'm happy to be here. And I've heard you say you love our country second only to the Word of God, the Bible. So you and I are both watching an all-out assault on everything righteous Americans have loved for a couple of centuries here. We see the great destabilization going on. Can you give me a paragraph on what you see the financial issues ahead here in 2022? We got more uncertainty. Do we have more globalization, more efforts at making America socialist? What do you see? Well, we see all of that, but I don't believe that the uncertainty is going to be quite as great in 2022 as it was in 2021. So I think there will be less uncertainty. But the certainty of what we have is better known now than what it was last year. So that would be the reason. What is done with that, we are already beginning to see a rising up of corporate America against the very things that they backed and have been all about. So that's going to be interesting to watch that play out this year. We have already seen a new economy. So I am an economist by trade. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a behavioral economist. We're kind of a dying breed. But when I look at things, I look at things through an eye of the behavior of consumers, the behavior of uh, business owners, executives, CEOs, and those kinds of things, and how that behavior reacts based upon different kinds of conditions. Generally, it's the same all the time under the certain economic conditions. The behavior is astonishing that it doesn't change over the year. Mm -hmm. You can almost expect the same things. A little bit different now, and it's been very difficult 
for an analyst or an economist like me who's doing analytical work every day on analyzing something that is such a moving target and forever changing that it's very difficult to get a handle on. I do look at the political atmosphere and a part of the grand agenda of the globalists. Yes. And there are some things that we found out last year that I'm a student of the Federal Reserve, always have been, but I didn't know that Janet Yellen, uh, our Secretary of Treasury, was such a radical mm -hmm. globalist. I don't think anybody knew. And that really changed a lot of my thinking about the future because I think she showed her hand. Okay. I think it was intentional a number of times about that. Let me just interject here, and she may be a puppet of the World Economic Forum, which is, I think, the major player right now as we speak. And perhaps this great reset, and I talk about the reset here often on this program, I believe it's the tribulation from which the church is absent, but that's not the purpose of this hour today. So this great reset, the World Economic Forum, Dan, their slogan is, you'll own nothing and be happy. Now, for a capitalist country like America, that's hard for us to wrap our brain around that these folks, and they've just met here in the last week or 10 days, they've just met, I believe, to plot and scheme to get their reset off the ground and get their agenda moving. But honestly, Dan, will own nothing and be happy? Do you think they really believe that? No, okay. I don't think they really believe that. I'm very close and familiar with the World Economic Forum. I've been studying the Great Reset for 32 years. It started in 1968, and I have been speaking about it for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. I have a good feel for what Klaus Schwab has done with the Great Reset and where he has taken it. It started by Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Foundation. It was called the Council of Rome when it first started, and then it evolved into so many other things. I think COVID, whether it was intentional or not intentional, was the greatest gift yep. to the economic forum that there could ever be. I don't know, even if it wasn't intentional, they have managed to use it as if it were very intentional. The Rockefeller Foundation, five years ago, wrote a paper on four different scenarios, the paper was presented for the first time to Denmark, and I have a video from one of the members of parliament that was explaining this to parliament last year and going through the so-called made-up scenarios, and it was everything that has happened to a T. Okay. And at the end of his conversation, he said to parliament, does anybody really think this was a coincidence? Yeah. It obviously was not. Their goal was always planned to use global warming and the environment as their springboard. Wasn't very effective, though. No, it wasn't effective at all. But this has been a very strong replacement yes. for that. So the Great Reset is certainly going to enter into the economy. The nightmare will be for them is what happens in a do-nothing America, which we could very easily have at the end of November. I can't imagine, I will say that if conservatives don't take control of the House of Representatives and the Senate, then nobody will be voting for the presidential elections because it will be quite obvious that it won't do any good. So I happen to think that the midterm elections are going to be too hard for them to fix. I think they're going to lose 40 seats. The left will lose 40 seats. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll lose 40 okay. seats. And that means we're doing nothing for the next two years after that. That's better than what they... That's true. That's better than the status quo. I'm going to play a quick clip here, and I want to get your response to it, Dan. Talking to Dan Celia for the hour, you can learn more at financialissues.org, financialissues.org. I'll say more about his radio and TV here just a little bit later. But I'm playing a clip here of Mark Hitchcock, and Mark's talking about Revelation 13 with global government, one world system, one world currency. The whole thing, and this is how, obviously, Weimar Germany started 80, 90 years ago, and the longing for a savior. And folks, that's what the world is longing for. Unfortunately, they're not in their heart longing for Jesus Christ as the savior. They're longing for a man called Antichrist. They don't know it, but that's who they're longing for. Mark, I want to get right to this thing that we've been talking about with the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. One world government, one world economies, you write about this in your book. It's taught about in the Word of God, is it not? 
It is, yeah. Revelation chapter 13 really is the entry point, I like to say, to this one world government, this one world economy that the Bible predicts. It says that one man is going to ultimately rule the world for the last three and a half years of this current age. We can see how that can happen. I mean, people today are looking for someone with answers. I like to go back to the time in Weimar, Germany, when the hyperinflation took place, and they were looking for someone to come and to bring some order from the chaos, and that's how they ended up with Adolf Hitler. That's right. It's the same thing in our world today. I think as we see more economic chaos and nations in chaos, people are going to be looking for a savior and a deliverer. And then the ability with exchange through the internet that you can purchase Mm -hmm. and then the global aspect of our economy, our credit cards, online banking, it all just seems to fit into the biblical narrative of the ancients, this modern technology. It does. And the Bible never tells us this end time economy will be cashless. But I believe it has to be in order to control it. Because as long as there's money, you can buy on the black market and kind of get around the system. But you can't buy or sell, the Bible says, unless you have this mark of the beast, this identifying mark of the Antichrist. And to me, the only way for that to happen is it's all got to be under his control. And we see today how that could happen with all the electronic technology there is, how you could control every transaction in the world. And people can't buy or sell without this mark. And again, electronic currency, an electronic global currency mm-hmm. is not beyond their own possibility. And we saw in the European Union the combination of all these different right. countries that had their own unique currency folding into the euro, and now that's every day reported. It's value reported right alongside the U.S. dollar or the Japanese yen. It is. But I think one thing that's very important to me in all of this to see is when people take this mark of the beast to be able to buy or sell, it's going to be really taking his name upon them. So it's really going to be a mark of their allegiance to him. And I think in that coming tribulation, unlike any other time, people are going to have a clear-cut choice. Are they going to take Christ? Or are they going to follow the Antichrist? And that's what's coming in this world. It's a sobering thing to think about. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Mark Hill. I have on the line Dan Celia, and he heads Financial Issues Stewardship Ministries. Learn more at financialissues.org. Dan, that little clip there of Dr. Mark Hitchcock said a lot of interesting things that he does expect the world to be cashless. And I think you do as well, correct? Correct. Soon? Yeah, I think soon. I think it really depends on the political climate, what happens midterm elections. I will say this, it almost has to happen no matter what happens in midterm elections in the next three years. I think that if they can't get a president of the United States stamp on it, Mm -hmm. it's going to change some things. And the only shot of that is a Biden and a Biden steps away from office for one reason or another, and then Harris to come alongside that. So I think it's going to be within the next three years if it's to be for sure. Well, one of the things that we keep hearing about is the potential bank shutdowns for days, two weeks, perhaps a month. And in the process, they're doing things with our money. How do you think that will play out? You and I talked about that off air. And I think a lot of my listeners are concerned about that because obviously they're going to be up to something sneaky if in fact they do shut down the banks and they come back a few weeks later. There's no cash. Everything's digital. Is that a possibility? Well, let me just go back a little bit, Jan, to something that we talked about off the air a little bit. And that's the Great Reset. Uh-huh. I don't want to go back to the details of the Great Reset, but to answer your question, I have to use that word reset. Mm-hmm. A reset is just that. Yes. It's a reset. That's right. So you can't go where we, you and I, and others believe we're going to go without a reset. Now, that reset calls for banks to close down. They would have to. There would be major changes that have to be made in systems. I would suspect, as Janet Yellen already talked about Mm -hmm. once, uh, we don't need a banking system, which is crazy when you think about it. But if you have an electronic currency, could we all just get by with a very sophisticated exchange system? And you no longer need banks. Now, the banks closing down, don't be scared. Anybody listening, they'll say, oh, my word, listen, we need to understand that, number one, if that is to be, there is not a thing you are going to do to protect against it. Mm -hmm. Not a thing. People will hear this, they will call me and say, well, what about this? What about that? There is nothing that you will be able to do to protect against that. Well, I'm going to put all my money at home. Okay. How are you going to explain it to the exchange system that you are using that you now have to turn that in because you kept it all at home? 
suppose they say, too bad, you missed your opportunity. How are you going to prevent what we all pray that we can prevent? Because your currency, you have to remember, your dollars are going to be worthless. Well, there would be a black market or something, and they don't want it exactly, but there won't be a black market because there would be no reason to have a black market. So you're not going to get anything for your dollars. Well, that's when they start looking for a savior then. Now, I believe this will be the left behind world during the tribulation. They're going to look for a savior that's going to bring them back to life as they once knew it. Exactly. And I think that that is going to be a great time for those that will find that savior. But at the same time, I don't want people today to start hoarding something sure. that is going to do them no good whatsoever. You can get out of debt that'll keep the wolves away from the door, and you can store food so that you can survive for a period of time, maybe with a barter system. I used to tell people that were worried about this very same thing, by the way, in 2008. I used to say to people, you need to understand that my jar of peanut butter will be worth more than your 10 ounces of gold. Because I'll be able to get a bag of rice with somebody mm -hmm. for my jar of peanut butter. You're going to get nothing for your gold. It made people pause. And I remember my father lived through the Great Depression. He was 21, 22 years old. He said there were farmers in the middle of the state that really had no idea what was going on. Okay. So I think for this to be successful by the radical globalist, all of these things have to happen at one time. They are carefully and methodically looking at every single angle that people are going to be taking to try to circumvent the social control that this globalist world is going to desire, want, and need. All right. And they're going to have solutions to keep that from happening. And I think that we would be much better served mm -hmm worried about our spiritual life, worried about who is going to heaven with us, sure. worried about evangelism, and to take our focus off any kind of material things other than what we need to exist. Now, that's easier said than done. Yes, it is. Because the other possibility is none of this might happen. I just want to morph a little bit here into this COVID economy, and I have some specific questions for you. If possible, I also want to talk a little bit about inflation because this is just a cruel tax on every one of my listeners that I don't think a year ago we had any idea this was going to hit us. And unless my listeners are getting constant wage hikes and social security hikes, they're just going backwards and backwards. Let's deal with that for just a moment. Let's play that clip of Tucker Carlson and then come back and talk for a couple of minutes, Dan, about this inflation curse that we're dealing with and what folks might do about that. Fake numbers allow fake economists to tell a fake story about what's actually happening to the country. And they've definitely been doing that. Our economists have conveyed that they feel that the impact of our proposals will be transitory. All of the economists that the president has been relying on suggest that there is a transitory nature to the inflation problem. Economists call all these things transitory effects. This inflation that we're experiencing is transitory. It is not going to be here long. We've had several months of high inflation that most economists, including me, believe will be transitory. We don't expect that upward pressure will produce substantially higher prices or that the effects will be persistent. We expect that they'll be transitory or temporary. The usual cavalcade of liars and dumb people. Maxine Waters on economic policy, please stay in your lane. But the last guy is regarded as very smart. His name is Jerome Powell. He is, believe it or not, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Powell has now updated his assessment, transitory, after weeks of being laughed at. He no longer uses that word, transitory, to describe inflation. Quote, I think it's probably a good time to retire that word, Powell said. Too late, Jerome. No one believes you anymore. No one ever did who was paying attention. In fact, there's only one accurate way to measure inflation, and somehow the Fed has not yet figured this out. Here it is. You ask yourself, what does it cost you to live in this country compared to what it cost you a year ago? It's not complicated. Do the math, and you will see that the actual number, the rise in inflation, is not even close to the 7% that Washington is claiming. In the last year, the price of a used car, for example, has gone up by more than 30%. Beef prices have risen by 21%. Crude oil, up 55%. Dimensional lumber, 35%. Wheat, 
37%. Sugar, 33%. Corn, 39%. Palm oil, 43%. Do you drink coffee in the morning ever? Oh, too bad. The price of coffee has risen 108% in the last year. Do you like breakfast cereal? Oh, sorry, oats are up 114%. And those are just the numbers you see on the label at the grocery store. In addition to conventional inflation, consumers also face widespread shrinkflation. That's an informal term that economists use for the stealth shrinking of consumer products. So companies sell you less for the same price. Have you bought a Snickers bar recently? If it seems a lot smaller than it used to, that's because it is. And those are just the products you buy. Most people in this country still live indoors, and the cost of living indoors has risen dramatically. Rents in Southern California, for example, have tripled in a single year. Dan Celia, I was somewhat amused, though not really, because these leftists, they're such liars, but they were calling this transitory, which is laughable. They knew this was going to be forever and ever. But how do my listeners cope with this situation of this rampant, out of control inflation that we've got now? I know my listeners over the last year and a half, because I called this inflation to the T, and I called the Federal Reserve to the T, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. The point I'm trying to make is I'm not that smart. It was so obvious. And I laughed at Jerome Powell in February. I just thought it was comical, and I said, typical Federal Reserve. And back in February, I said, in December, before that, I called the inflation. I said, it's going to be nonstop. Mm -hmm. It's going to continue to rise. And in February, when Jerome Powell came out, and said this, I said, the most interesting part about this is how he's going to reverse course. Because like the Fed always does through time, they manage from behind. And that's exactly what they're doing right now. They're managing from behind because they couldn't see this freight train that was as plain as day coming. Why? Because everybody, they weren't just lying. They were making predictions and hoping that it would happen just because they made the prediction. They were making predictions about something being transitory that was as obvious as could be, wasn't, and hoping that it would be transitory. There was no chance of any of that happening, no chance whatsoever. But how does the I average listener fight back? What can you do? And that's what you have to look at when you're looking about fighting back. And this is what I try to tell people today. you got to look at your options. There is no plan that you can adopt at this point to fight back. So you've got to look at the obvious and be very practical mm -hmm. about it. No matter what you do, you're not going to change the fact that your potatoes are going to cost you a lot more money. That's never going to change. No matter how, you can't prepare for that. So unless you can work a second and third job to make more money, what happens is what always happens. This happened in the Carter years. It happened in 2008, 9, and 10. People will change their buying habits. It's not because I think that's what will happen. It's because I know that's the only thing that can happen. Okay. Or inflation go away. So anybody that gives anybody the how they can do to protect against it is just wrong. What you have to do is prepare the best you can for what is going to happen. And you will change your buying habits, your driving habits, your work habits. You're going to be changing a lot of things. That is going to be part of a new normal, Yes. whether it's temporary new normal, like it was in the Jimmy Carter years, or whether it's going to be a permanent new normal. But I wish I could say, well, all people have to do is this, this, and this. They're Understand. not going to solve the commodity crisis. By the way, my guest for the hour is Dan Celia, and again, he's a financial analyst and planner and just knows a whole lot about economic issues. Learn more at financialissues.org, financialissues.org, and he's got a radio and a television program. He's a head of Financial Issues Stewardship Ministries, and if you'll go to that website, financialissues.org, and look up where you can find him on radio and TV or on his website, it's a wealth of information as well. You can supplement for, we only have less than an hour to do that on this program. But where I want to go in part two of my programming is I just want to look a little bit more into the COVID economy. What about vaccine passports? They're already existing in some states, the blue states. They're coming to perhaps your neighborhood. How's that going to affect the economy and how's that going to affect your bottom line? Some other things, we've just dealt with lockdowns and particularly in 2020. 
are they coming back? I mean, all of this so dynamically and dramatically affects economic issues, which is why talking about this 10 years ago versus today and just now into 2022, it's kind of a whole new world. Say just a quick heads up here that we have an Understanding the Times night coming up Thursday, February 10th. Thursday, February 10th, we will be featuring an evening with Pastor Tom Hughes of Hope for Our Times. Again, Thursday, February 10th, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time. Location, Revive Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And you can live stream this anywhere in the world at MarkHenryMinistries.com, MarkHenryMinistries.com. Again, Understanding the Times, Thursday, February 10th, 7 to 9 p.m. Central. Let me just get a quick heads up here because Olive Tree is all over social media. We're on Telegram, we're on Facebook, we're on Gab, Instagram, Rumble, YouTube. Sadly, people are impersonating us all over social media. So would you please understand that we don't appeal for money ever on these social media platforms. There's fake YouTubes of our radio program out there by dozens and dozens of them. Just ignore them, please. We wouldn't stoop to the level that these folks are stooping to make everybody look like fools, starting with myself. That's what's happening on social media. Just keep an eye open for all the phony that's out there impersonating Olive Tree Ministries and yours truly. I'm back in just a minute or two. Don't go away. We hope you'll stay in touch with us online through olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. You can call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Write us through the mail at Olive Tree Ministries in Jan Markell, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. In an age of fake news and false teaching, thank you for trusting, understanding the Times Radio and Olive Tree Ministries. Are there enemies within the church? That is the statement of a new film Olive Tree Ministry carries. The film, Enemies Within the Church, heralds a clarion call for Christians to turn away from popular yet errant beliefs held in contradiction to the Bible. This incredible DVD examines the evidence and exposes the false teachers behind many of the false movements in the church today. The leftist agenda hit mainline Protestant churches 100 years ago and infiltrated evangelical schools and churches 30 years ago. Today, it is doing enormous damage to the gospel and it is leading Christians into dangerous territory. You can order Enemies Within the Church in our online store at olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. You can call our office Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Or just send $12 to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. There is no shipping cost in the U.S. Let's contend for the faith as the Bible exhorts us to do while we still have time, and let's occupy until He comes. We need to be less focused on the material things that we have and more focused on the things of God and understanding more and more that He's still on the throne. Yes. Nothing has changed. And think about us, how grateful we are that we have a sovereign God that we rely on. And think about all those people you know that don't have that. So this is an opportunity for us with some to be a great evangelist among our families and our friends. We know you can't always be by a radio, so catch Understanding the Times Radio at your convenience online. Watch the video version of the program or listen to the audio at olivetreeviews.org. Then to complete archives on YouTube, on Rumble, on LightSource, and on his channel, Christian TV. Now here are Jan Markell and her guest, 
financial analyst Dan Celia to wrap up today's programming. Today, like it or not, we're all relying on the security and trustworthiness of electronic systems and massive banks to manage our savings and handle our finances. More and more, people in the Western world are buying, selling, and giving, not with physical money, coins, and bills, but through a series of touches on a small screen. We love the convenience of managing our accounts from our palms. For the most of us, this technology is still on the outside of our hand in our smartphones, but it's only two millimeters from where Osterlund would like it to be, under our skin. Welcome back. That was Dr. David Jeremiah. I've played two or three clips of him this particular hour. And by the way, vaccine passport, well, the literal passport in Sweden is under the skin, in the hand. Now that's eerily foreshadowing the mark of the beast. Is it the mark? No, folks, it is not. At this point, it is not the mark of the beast. We don't have an antichrist. So he may be alive, but he's not reigning. He's not in power. We have no idea who he is. The church never will know who he is because we'll be gone enjoying heaven during that tribulation when the Antichrist reigns. But when we have vaccine passports being inserted in Sweden, in a chip, under the skin, in the hand, I think we better start paying close attention, which is why I scheduled today's program actually several weeks ago with my guest, Dan Celia, and Dan heads the Financial Issues Stewardship Ministries, financialissues.org. Head to his website if you really want to understand some financial issues here in the last days. And my goodness, I've referred to some other things here in recent months about the headline I saw in Israel National News. The headline read, Government won't force you to take the vaccine, but Amazon will, the airlines will, the banks will. And then the rest of that little subheadline said, you won't be able to buy, sell, or trade without the vaccine. Again, all of this falls under the category of end-time finances, end-time financial issues. In the meantime, how do we cope with the insanity that we're seeing I'm not sure that there's a real good answer. I think my guest has some suggestions on how to protect yourself. We've referenced a few. We'll reference a few more. Dan Celia, let's just head for a moment here to vaccine passports, because you and I talked a little bit about them. Again, in Sweden, vaccine passports are going to be in a chip under the skin in the hand. In Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I headquarter now, you are not going to be able to do anything in Minneapolis and St. Paul proper without showing a vaccine passport. How is this going to affect the economy? That's my basic bottom line. I can't believe it's going to be for the good. No, it's not going to be for the good at all. It's going to be horrifying for the economy. It is going to keep us, let me just start before us, other companies. It's going to keep companies holding back, a difficulty getting employees, low productivity, high prices, low consumer spending. It's going to have a devastating impact on the economy. The economy can only get worse under that circumstance. Mm -hmm. The question is, how bad will it get before it's unbearable and nobody can deal with it? Well, that is going to be what I think some in the globe would like to see happen sooner rather than later. But it is going to be a very, very difficult thing for us to cope with because we're going to have to make some hard decisions if we choose to make those decisions. And I think if you live in a blue state, I'd be moving. That's what we did okay. I lived in Pennsylvania. That's good advice. The free state of Florida now. And I think that it's quite obvious that the government is going to continue to push these vaccine passports. They refuse to look at what has happened in some states. And I use Florida as an example. Florida's had no mandates on anything since September of 2020. And no passports here or no really shutdown. And we see our economy here thriving. Yes, And this has got the left extremely angry, and that anger is going to continue to build against the red states, against the conservatives, yes. against the unvaccinated, yes. to a frenzy place. Well, persecution against the unvaccinated is starting to escalate to very scary proportions. Lockdowns, do you think they're coming back or not? I think lockdowns are coming back, but I don't think they're going to be successful, Okay, not in the red states. I think people are starting to stand up and speak up. Dan, you said to me, you think that people are literally tiring of COVID and are going to start to just plain walk away from it. 
I think they are. I think they're already doing it in some areas. People are just tired of it. People are smart enough to look around and see all their friends that have gotten sick over the last couple of months and say, well, it wasn't any worse than a bad flu for some people. Correct. Some people pretty minor. And they're seeing that. They're saying, I never did this when it was flu season. I'm not going to do it now. I think we're going to start to see a little bit of normalization come into at least those states that are going to allow that. I think people are saying, if I get it, I get it. And they're going to have to get out and start doing things. And that may be the case for the average citizen. But if the government continues to insist that this is the crisis, we're not going to let go to waste, then it doesn't matter if your average citizen says we're moving on because the leftist government is not, or they're going to pick up on another crisis. Now, the globalists thrive on a crisis. So we've had COVID. They've tried, as we referred earlier, they tried climate change. How about supply chain, shortage of goods, shortage of food? The supply chain is going to become a crisis, I believe, leading to even worse shortage of goods and possibly shortage of food. So will these be the next crises that the world leaders can't let go to waste? It will be the next crisis. I said that a year ago, there are going to be food shortages. Yes. There's no doubt about it. It started this year with fertilizer shortages. We have dramatic shortages in fertilizer and can't think of what the other chemicals called that protects crops, that is almost non-existent. Now, we can get through the next harvest. We're not going to get through anything more than that, but this harvest, the next harvest, is going to be yielding quite a bit less because of the lack of fertilizer and bug and pest protection. We're going to see lower harvests and lower yields, and that's going to drive commodity up. Commodity prices are everything when it comes to inflation. The reason why I said a year and two months ago that we were going to have inflation and it's going to be here to stay was because of commodity prices. And that's what you look at. That's what every good economist ought to be looking at. I assume they were and they were ignoring it because I don't want to think that they weren't smart enough to see it. We have to have food shortages. That will be the next thing. There will be a organizational meeting of everything from longshoremen to Teamsters to the government that is going to orchestrate a continuation of supply chains. The denial that they're in over empty shelves Mm -hmm. in grocery stores is all just a bunch of propaganda. We have to remember, Jan, that they can accomplish whatever they want because the first order of business on a globalist or a Marxist regime as it begins to wind up is a propaganda machine. And we've had a state-run media now for three years. So that was where it started. They got that. Microsoft bought another large media company between the state-run media and what will be the state marching orders of the technology companies. We're going to continue to see more propaganda. The question is, can we hope that enough of programs like yours, mine, and others that are out there get enough play? You know, I made a joke to my listeners, but I was serious. I said, we'll be on ham radio if we have to, but we're going to proclaim the truth. I have to say this, but your listeners need to understand that there is going to be a great persecution of, yes, unvaccinated, but there has to be, not because it's going to lead to end times, because for the left to achieve, there has to be a great minimalization of Christians. Yes. Adolf Hitler was successful because he minimized Jews all the way down to a street rat with his propaganda machine. Christians have to be minimalized because the left cannot accomplish what they want as long as they have a yardstick in front of them by which some are going to measure them by. As long as there is a absolute values or God's values in front of them, they got to get rid of a moral compass, the yardstick by which to be measured by. That is you and me, and our listeners, and they need to understand, because they need to tell their children, they need to build the conviction that they're going to need to stand firmly on the rock of Christ, because they're going to need it, because we will be minimalized, and we will be persecuted. And the vaccine passport is the beginning of that. If you minimize a few people, the society begins to numb, and they will numb. I remember years ago, everybody was ranting and raving, the intelligentsia of Hollywood, as I call it, ranting about the homeless population. It was bad. That's fine. But you know what? 
in six months, we were just stepping over the homeless people. We get inoculated and numb very quickly. True. There are some things that are definitely going to happen, and a food shortage is the greatest final crisis that could come to America. Adolf Hitler got elected for one reason. He promised everybody a loaf of bread on the table. That was his campaign. His whole campaign was built upon that because people were starving. That's where if none of this works, if the COVID, the passports, if that doesn't work, the food shortage will. And that's very easy to orchestrate. Right. And I opened the program talking about the Bible and the Bible's references to all of these things. And that would be heavily Revelation 13 and the seal judgments found in Revelation 6. Again, folks, not saying that you and I won't go through some terrible times of trial here. We do not go through the terrible tribulation, which talks about starvation, the issues of inflation, etc., that are so off the chart horrible. Again, God spares the church from his wrath. Unfortunately, God allows the church to go through some of man's wrath. I think, Dan, the thing I have seen in the last two years is that people, not just in America, but lots of countries, are relying too much on the government for safety and even for health. Not everyone. Obviously, we see demonstrations in Australia, in parts of Europe, and some other countries of the world. We see people saying, enough is enough, and we don't want you to be looking out for our safety and health. We want to look out for our own safety and health. And obviously, a left-behind society will be willing to follow big government. And I'm talking about big government right now here in this church age. It's gotten out of control and people leaning on it, some anyway, leaning on government for everything. And that troubles me. That really troubles me. Instead of leaning on the Lord. Troubles me a great deal as well. And you're right when people ask me, is this the mark of the beast? If it is, what are we doing? I always tell them, well, it's not the mark of the beast. I'm not going to be here when that happens. And I agree with all that you said, but nonetheless, there's going to be an awful lot that we probably will experience leading up to this. And we may. And we need to ready ourselves. I think some of the minimalization that has to get done here in the short term to drive the propaganda machine will happen. And people ask, and they will ask you, call into me every day and ask me, what are we going to do? How do we fix it? I believe there's only one way it can be fixed, and that's from the pulpit. I don't think it can be fixed anywhere else. I think there has to be a great uprising and unity of the church. But we have a church that can't agree on what songs to sing. True. If we have a church that can't unite on the blood of Calvary, forget everything else. If we can't unite on the blood of Calvary, then we have a problem. And guess what? I don't think we can unite on that because there's too many churches that have essentials that aren't essentials at all. But if we could unite... We could change all this because what would happen is there would be a huge power shift in America and the power would go to us and we could make some changes. Now, I don't know if that's God's plan. I don't know if he's waiting for that remnant to rise up. We don't know if the remnant is going to be made smaller for his purposes. Certainly, I always said when the Lord returns, he's going to find me with a sword in my hand. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be crawled up in fetal position in a corner somewhere. We need to keep fighting. We don't know when the Lord is going to come, but he will come quickly. We don't know when that's going to be. We obviously have to be prepared, but I believe his church could do a great work to carry that. I think the church could raise up to a great power in the United States. If we have time. I'm not sure we have time for the church to rise up. Like Well, no. It may. Again, we don't know. If God wills it and wants it, it can happen. But unfortunately, In the meantime, as we try to organize that, a lot of people are going to come to the saving grace of Christ. Yes, thank you for referencing that, because that is so essential. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell, and I have on the line Dan Celia, and he heads Financial Issues Stewardship Ministries. Learn more at financialissues.org. If you've got a question concerning financial issues, why don't you write him at that address? I'm not quite finished yet with the onset of the cashless society, because, folks, it's going to be here sooner than you can imagine. The main beneficiaries of this development are located on the other side of the Atlantic. Conventional credit card companies like Visa and MasterCard, but also new payment service providers like Google or Apple and Amazon. The online retailer has now opened a number of supermarkets without checkouts. Customers simply scan their phones at the entrance. After that, cameras track what items they select. 
Facial recognition technology allows the system to identify each customer and bill their credit card as they leave. The receipt for their purchases then appears in their Amazon Go app. No cash. It's a trend that's growing in popularity worldwide. Last year, Visa ran a campaign in which it offered 50 restaurants $10,000 each if they agreed to stop accepting cash. I don't know. Michael Ryan wasn't able to apply as his restaurant had already gone cashless. I've been in this business a long time and I feel like there's a lot of theft when you have cash around. So when there's cash in the safe downstairs, in the office, behind the counter, everyone's dipping in, everyone's sharing. You share your drawer with another employee, there's cash always goes missing. So it's just like an, this eliminated theft issue. So that's off the table. But the more importantly, it's like today I was late to work. The place can still open because they don't need to go to the safe, get cash, set up the store. He can just arrive and open up. So it's from an operational standpoint, it's a breeze. So it's coming. We don't know when, but I think probably just over the horizon. But Dan, because we're on this issue right now of cashless, I just want to jump to another banking story. Because I've been talking to Dan Celia here for the hour about the end time money plan. What do we do? How do we cope? How does the average listener, how does the average Christian cope financially with all that's transpired here, actually in the last two years, if you really want to get specific? including the raging inflation and the many, many things we've talked about now for almost an hour. Mike Lindell, and he's headquartered here in Minnesota, as most folks know, again, a ragingly blue state, quite socialist, to be honest. Mike Lindell has had two banks shut him down, and I'm assuming he can get to his money, though I don't know. Dan, where is this going? Could good conservative people or good Christians Could our bank shut us down because they don't agree with our politics? Well, I think they could and they will in certain areas and certain states. I mean, I think that is going to continue to happen. We've been seeing a lot about this, even in the news, in the Wall Street Journal and other places in the news about what big banks are doing. So I think, yeah, they could do that. I mean, they could shut us down. That doesn't mean we're going to lose our money. I just say that to people listening. You need to be diversified. I try to use credit unions and I use banks, and and that's something that people think about. There's a great Christian community credit union you can use. I use my brokerage account, my investment account for money markets and things that I have a little more control of. And I think everybody, Jan, should have cash at home for this reason. You have to have cash at home. The reason I say that, because if we had a massive bank shutdown or ATM shutdown, you've got to have some cash to be able to put gas in your car or to maybe get to the emergency room or whatever you might need to do in the short term. There are some countries in Europe that cash is worthless, and that's coming here to America, I'm sure, anytime. I just played a clip. Yeah, I think that it's coming to the world, but it doesn't mean your cash is going to be worthless. It means you're going to have whatever the alternative is. If the alternative at home becomes some sort of crypto currency card, then that's what you have at home. But I think it's critically important that all of your wealth and all of your money is not in an institution somewhere that the government can control. Remember something, and I've been saying this since 2009, I've been begging people to start moving money out of their IRA accounts and put it Mm -hmm. over in their brokerage account because the government's going to control all that. There's $22 trillion sitting in IRA monies, and the government is just chafing at the bit to get it. And the government thinks if they regulate it, they control it. So I believe that what happened two years ago when they changed the rules on IRAs and qualified accounts, I think it was nothing more than a test. Okay. I think they ran that up the flagpole to see if it would fly. It did. Nobody said mum so they can control it. And we have to be conscious and aware of that. So we should have some food at home. We should have some currency at home, usable currency for the times for whatever that might be. I mean, you have to have all those things at home. Is it going to last? Of course not. People are going to store gold. They're going to store silver. It will be worthless. It's going to be of no value. Well, yeah, but I can use that. You're not going to use that for anything. You're not going to slice some of it off right, right. in a grocery store. It's not going to happen. Right. And the law's already on the books to make it illegal as a currency from 1935. They just have to enact it. They don't have to pass a law. And they're not going to allow an alternative currency to undermine what they're trying to do. They're never going to allow that. So please don't put all your money into that. Nobody's being helped except for the salesman selling you all that. We've got to think logically through scenarios. And unfortunately, 
too many people are not. Dan, you have given, and you've already touched on them, so I don't want to be redundant, what to do to protect my listeners. And you've said have cash at home, and I think you referenced in another message of yours I heard, grow some food if you can do that. That would be very helpful. You've emphasized the uselessness that gold and silver is going to be here eventually. And one of the things you said about protecting yourself, and I certainly made a note of this, This is easier said than done, and that's get out of debt. I got an article here by Fox Business in front of me, and headline is Americans are falling into deeper debt as household incomes drop, cost of living rises. Let me read two short paragraphs. More Americans are falling deeper into debt as median incomes have dropped amid the rising costs of housing, food, gas, transportation, etc., according to the 2021 American Household Credit Card Debt Study found that U.S. households are $15 trillion in debt, and that's up considerably from the previous year. And then it goes on to say, we owe a trillion dollars on our credit cards, which often have interest rates as high as 28%. We've borrowed a trillion dollars to buy new cars, which plummet in value the minute you drive off the lot. And we've racked up about $1.5 trillion for college diplomas with the dubious worth. And then 73% of Americans die with huge debt, as much as $60,000. And then the article concludes, even before the coronavirus appeared, many American families were falling behind on student loans. Americans are getting poorer, and the entire debt is increasing to the point of no return. The unfunded liabilities are $162 trillion. We can't wrap our brain around that. Obviously, somebody's going to come along. I call him Mr. Fix-It. Mr. Antichrist is going to come along and say, I'm going to wipe out all your debt. That'll be during the tribulation. And folks will flock to him just because he's going to get them out of debt. Dan, I'm down to two, three minutes. I think we should wind this down on a little more positive note because God is in control. He's allowing all of this to happen for his purposes. And I know you agree with that. I do. And I would hope that everybody listening would, if they're not already, become very kingdom-focused. I think that this is an opportunity. God has done all kinds of things in our world to bring people to their knees. Christians as well need to get to their knees to repent and get more focused on the work of the kingdom and the kingdom itself. And this is all part of the plan from the government. Debt is a good thing because it's something that people will do anything to get out of. And that's a great control mechanism. So you need to be focused on that for sure. But we need to be less focused on the material things that we have and more focused on the things of God and understanding more and more that he's still on the throne. Yes, Nothing has changed. And think about us, how grateful we are that we have a sovereign God that we rely on. And think about all those people you know that don't have that. So this is an opportunity for us with some to be a great evangelist among our families and our friends and to help people become very focused on that. It's all, like I said, and like you repeated, it is easier said than done. I know that I get that, I understand it. But nonetheless, we have to stop focusing on how much money you are making or how much you aren't making. The debt is not getting any better. The reduction in income is going to continue. We are going to continue to see money robbed out of our pocket through higher gasoline prices and food prices alone. So we're losing our discretionary income. There isn't going to be any, and we need to really start to think logically through that and work as hard as we can still now to get out of debt because of the Lord tarries. That could be the one thing that is going to be a huge help to us and our family. And speaking of debt, the number one reason that people are getting in debt is medical debt. Interesting. That's the number one reason, and it's the number one reason among senior citizens. You got questions for Dan? Write them at financialissues.org, financialissues.org. I know either he or someone on his staff would be happy to help you with your particular question. Check out his radio and TV. You need to find that info at financialissues.org as well. You can keep updated daily, not just now and then when programs like mine feature a financial analyst. I just want to go out of the program here with a couple of Bible verses, because I think it's important we maintain that perspective. Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And the psalmist writes, turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain, Psalm 119, 36. 
the last verse I'll quote here, Ecclesiastes 5.10, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. I want to thank you for listening, folks, and we will talk to you again next week.